Matchbox 20 would be one of several bands who came from Florida during the mid to late 90s and dominated rock radio and MTV. Their debut album was a massive success, moving in excess of 12 million copies just in America. But despite being commercially successful, critics blasted the group as being too bland and faceless, while hipsters simply called them uncool. Despite the band's success, frontman Rob Thomas came from a pretty broken home and had a pretty screwed up childhood. Today, let's take a look at the childhood of Rob Thomas that you may not know about. Born on a US Army base in Germany to a sergeant father and an alcoholic mother, Matchbox 20's frontman Rob Thomas had a rough childhood. Thomas would write about his mother in the Wall Street Journal saying, and I quote, My mom Mamie married at the age of 14 to escape her abusive mother Maddie. She had her first child at 16, divorced, remarried, had me at 21, and divorced again when I was two in the mid 70s. We were all but doomed to a life of poverty, but to her credit, my mother did manage to give us a better life. His mother would soon become a computer programmer to support her family, and by the time Thomas was a toddler, his parents had divorced, his mom would take his older sister to live in Columbia, South Carolina, and Thomas would be shuttled off to live in rural South Carolina, hanging out with his grandmother, who was also an alcoholic. His grandmother would run a general store where she sold pot and moonshine under the counter. Thomas, for his part, would try to not anger his grandmother, telling the Wall Street Journal that she'd frequently come after anyone who crossed her with a gun. By the time Rob turned 10, his grandmother mysteriously died after being hit by a car in an area where there were no sightline issues for drivers. Then there's his aunt Monkey, who famously in 1975 hired serial killer Pee Wee Gaskins to kill her ex-boyfriend. She would go to prison for 30 years and soon started a relationship with Gaskins. By the time Rob was 10 years old, he would move in with his sister and mother to a trailer park in Orlando, Florida, and his mother kept some pretty rough company partying and hanging out with bikers who would sometimes beat her up, and she in turn would take out her frustrations on Rob, with him telling the Wall Street Journal that his mother was simply trying to relive the childhood she missed when she was a teen. By the time Rob was 12, his older sister would run away from home to be with her boyfriend, making his situation at home only worse. Parties were a common sight at the Thomas home, and a young Rob would even sometimes play bartender. It wasn't uncommon for Rob to wake up the following morning after a party had been thrown to be surrounded by 10 or more bodies. It was around this time that Rob's mother was diagnosed with cancer, but she continued to drink and smoke. The doctors gave Thomas's mother six months to live with him, recalling to the LA Times, that aged me quickly. But his mother would beat the odds pulling through her cancer ordeal, and amongst all the chaos in his family life, he would find his calling at a young age, which was music, getting his first instrument at the age of 10, which was a Casio keyboard. His early years in South Carolina would convince him that he wanted to be a songwriter, taking cues from the old country greats, before getting into Billy Joel, Elton John, The Cure, as well as Elvis Costello. He would recall to Rolling Stone how he was a nerd in school and soon started writing his own songs in hopes of becoming one of the cool kids, recalling, at parties all the football players would be drunk and passed out, and I'd be in the living room with all their girlfriends around me, playing the piano, every song like a bad version of a Lionel Richie solo album. It was in high school that Thomas would end up playing in a few cover bands, one of which was named Fair Warning. But by the time he got to his senior year, he dropped out of school after Fair Warning got a residency, performing at a local Sheridan hotel. But the band would blow their big opportunity after several of its members were caught stealing food and drinks from the hotel. What followed was perhaps one of the roughest times in Thomas's life. He would leave home at the age of 17 and spend the next three years living homeless, roaming the area between South Carolina and Florida spending his days crashing at friends' houses and on park benches while finessing his musical skills on guitar and that Casio keyboard he received when he was younger. He would tell Forbes, when I was hitchhiking, I was like 17, 18, I still had that little keyboard and I would hitchhike around the country and I would sit at 2 in the morning on the off ramps with this keyboard on my lap, writing songs on it. I wrote 3 a.m. on that keyboard. One time I was hitchhiking and I met up with a bunch of girls at spring break that let me stay in their room and bought me drinks and food for the whole week. And all I had to do was at night pull out my keyboard when everybody came back to the room and play them songs. So I was actually singing for my supper when I was like 17, 18 years old. Thomas would admit to the Huffington Post that sometimes for song ideas, he would create drama or get himself in bad situations, recalling, 
When I was young, I used to think I had to create drama around my personal life so I could write about it. A lot of the relationships and bad decisions of my early 20s was me subconsciously wanting to create the kind of environment that bleeds angry songs. I was also trying to get into horrible relationships that I knew would fall apart spectacularly. So once they did, I could write about them. He would also take up odd jobs during this time, including working at a biker bar, where he became known as the singing busboy. Despite his difficult set of circumstances, those years on the streets gave Thomas some wisdom. With him telling the LA Times, there were times when it seemed rough, but all these kids at school were like drunk jerks and freaks with beer keggers. Maybe if I hadn't been homeless, I wouldn't have started thinking clearly until I was out of college. In my head, I was older, older than everybody my age. Despite thinking he was wiser than his peers, Thomas did do a lot of stupid things. He ended up serving two months in jail after stealing a car, and at one point took so much acid that he severely burned his hands on dry ice, to the point that the doctors thought they might have to amputate his hands. By the early 90s, Thomas would return to Florida and set up shop in Orlando, where he met his future Matchbox 20 bandmates. It was by the middle part of the decade Matchbox 20 would nab a recording contract, and their debut record 1996's Yourself or Someone Like You would prove to be a massive success, moving in excess of 10 million copies. And it was during the tour to support their first album, Thomas started dabbling in hard drugs, something he attributed to his mother telling Forbes, all of my bad habits come from her and all of my good habits come from her. Matchbox 20 would end up releasing several more successful albums until 2004, when they took a hiatus so its members could pursue other musical projects. It was two years later in 2006 that Thomas's mother would pass away. It was a confusing time for the frontman with Thomas's friend and producer Matt Serletic, who also discovered Matchbox 20, telling Rolling Stone that despite having repaired his relationship with his mother, they still had their difficult moments, with Thomas recalling in the same interview, she'd sometimes show up drunk to his concerts only for him to have her removed. Their difficult relationship even soon started to affect Thomas's marriage. And for a long time, Thomas kept pretty quiet about his mother and their relationship for fear of upsetting her. Sir Leddick would tell Rolling Stone he had such a strange relationship with his mother. He'd run from her, but also wanted her approval. She was half crazy and very loving and yet very vindictive. A lot of it had to do with his marriage. It's one of those things that was never quite approved of. And then when she died three years ago, he simply fell apart. Thomas would add in the same interview what happened after his mother passed away. I went on a nasty drinking binge and couldn't stop. I was mad that she had left and I could no longer be angry at her. And then I started to get this feeling that right around the corner something horrible was waiting. After that I completely lost my coping skills. This feels like the most adult burden I've ever had to carry. And I think it's necessary to talk about it because it's a huge part of who I am and the reason I am the way I am. That does it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching. Be sure to hit the like button and subscribe, and we'll see you again in Rock and Roll True Stories. Take care.